Hello, folks, and welcome to episode 9 of Platform Enterprise, the show that platforms projects which protect the planet and empower people. I'm your host, Rachel Donald, and I also produce the Platform Enterprise newsletter, which investigates the deceit and corruption keeping the world in crisis. Each investigation is linked to that week's podcast, and you can find them both at www.platformenterprise.com. So, pause the episode, get on your browser, and type in www.platformenterprise.com to subscribe to both the podcast and the newsletter, and get both delivered straight to your inbox every week. On the show this week is Nika Dubrowski, an artist, activist, and late wife of David Graeber, with whom she was working on the Museum of Care project before he passed last year. Now, Nika is working in collaboration with people around the world to create this museum, a museum that redefines art as a method of care. We talked about how restructuring society could be as simple as putting value in relationships as opposed to things and artifacts, and how museums were seen as sacred spaces when she was growing up in the Soviet Union. Nika was recommended by Dennis in episode two, so I would suggest listening to that episode first if you haven't already, and I would also highly recommend listening to episode four with Lisa Lux, who gave a thorough introduction to the concept of organizing society around care. I hope you find this conversation as stimulating as I did, really. Enjoy. Nika, I'm so happy to to have you here today, especially after having you recommended, the fact that you were recommended by Dennis. Uh, it, it's great to have you on the show to continue the conversation. Thank you for having me. So could you introduce yourself a little bit to, to people that don't know what who you are or what you're doing? So I'm an artist and uh, a writer. I... Uh, run several projects. One of them is called Anthropology for All, Anthropology for Kids. That was uh, started with um, uh, my husband, uh, David Graeber, an anthropologist and activist who passed away on 2nd of September. Uh, and after uh, his death, um, me, my friends and his friends, and some people who just was uh, a readers of David's text, we, uh, we created a public celebration of his life more than a funeral called mm-hmm. Carnival for David. So that's my what I'm doing now. What you're doing now is Carnival for David. Now, Carnival for David is, uh, is, uh, was an event um, that we host uh, in 11th of October, and that's how the Museum of Care was born. So before Carnival, Museum of Care was a bunch of texts and conversations with friends. And then uh, suddenly David died. And so mm. we, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a way how to get together in, uh, in grief and memory. Mm. And then all this uh, solidarity network suddenly appeared. It uh, was overwhelming because it was... M- more than 250 locations around the world where people host their carnivals. Uh-huh. So that's how that's how this network was born. And then um, we all decided that we try this experiment of creating a museum of care that uh, would not locate it in a certain physical building, but uh, will be more like a social sculpture. Right. Okay. So let's let, let's break the the terminology down a little bit. So it, it was Museum of Care was was originally texts. Um, could you discuss what those texts were were analyzing? Yeah. So this um, this text was analyzing um, basically it was analyzing the way how we create values in our society. Mm-hmm. So it was analyzing. Um, trying to understand uh, how we come up with the idea of genius and how we come up with the ideas of priceless things, like, for example, artifacts. And uh, one of the conclusions uh, that we come up with is that, uh, let's give me an example, Uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted uh, a famous Jaconda only once, but then... uh, at the same time, was probably many other important or beautiful or valuable artifacts was painted and created. 
but this particular one is so important for us as a humanity because so much maintenance work were invested in mm -hmm. these paintings. So many people wrote about that, reproduce mm -hmm. it, copy that, uh, talk it, <laughs> talk about this. And so mm -hmm. most of these people, if you look carefully, they're women. Because if you look who is uh, who is actually teaching art, who is a guide in museums, who is um, uh, who is the wives of all of these famous male artists, <laughs> uh, and so on and so forth, like seventy percent of them women. But if you look who is um, considered to be a genius and the producers of this valuable artifact, that will be a male, and it's not necessarily biological gender. It's also the way how how we approach who's a creator and who's a supporter of the creation. So the Museum of Case uh, was an um, attempt, the text was an attempt to analyze it and try to propose in a way practical solutions how to rearrange it. Right, okay. So essentially what the, the Museum of Care text very adequately pointed out is that we culture tends to latch on to a couple of things and then the extra work that is put in by supporters i.e different means of of production um actually create a higher that's what creates the higher value and yet these people that have put the time in either maintaining writing about talking about these things that elevate its status they are never perceived to be the the geniuses or the creators or, or the producers of its value they are simply kind of left behind by history yeah and it's uh, not only uh, unfair um mm. this is actually a smaller question the more important question is how we organize how overall as a society um our value system as i said in the beginning so if we all reconsider what is valuable the museums mm. will look different the factories will look different or maybe didn't exist the whole society will be for sure i think there's a a big conversation going on at the moment uh, because of the pandemic and the fact that workers have lost their jobs and yet billionaires are richer and and who is actually the the, the valuable asset here it's not um, CEOs on the ground actually making whatever is perceived to be valuable. It's people contributing to value. Um, so to take that and look at it uh, through the lens of art is, is, is very, very, very interesting. Can you tell me why um, exactly why you wanted, you called it the museum of care? Ever since I've been reading your articles, um, I've been very, very curious as to word museum uh, I feel like there's a big story behind that yeah I think museums for everybody uh, in our world is like a contemporary temples that producing uh, producing the values also financial values yeah because this is a places where they store something that a priceless that doesn't have a value so it's taken out of the market everybody's living in the market account economy everybody's producing things that we use, like everyday objects. But then here we have a special territory in which uh, it's actually things that don't supposed to be sold and bought. It's a mm -hmm. representation of like national identity, um, humanity as a whole, and so forth and so on. So that's one reason. And another reason, I'm an artist myself, and uh, I grew up in St. Peter, Leningrad, Soviet Union. And mm -hmm. for me, like the, uh, the Sunday trips to Hermitage, that was like almost as um, in the rural America, people will go to church. Okay, so you're trying to create um, a space that's incredibly valuable in that it discusses, exhibits, supports um things that are so valuable to the the human condition and human nature that they exist out with the the market economy not of... at all no nope. quite opposite <laughs> um directly opposite so i mm -hmm. believe that um um uh, human life and the human relationship is the most valuable things as we were talking about uh, mona lisa and all these people who invested 
in the making Mona Lisa an icon. So mm -hmm. I believe that uh, the the real value is in the relationship that unfolded over the hundreds of years between these people and this artifact. So mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, the idea is not created a space where like the other artifacts uh, will be evaluated or created. The idea is like basically destroy the museums and uh, uh, and figure out how to create um, an everyday life that will have the same priceness because yeah because as you said uh, our society is really um, perverse where mm -hmm. uh, the way how we attribute value to to work to mm -hmm. objects or how we evaluate people why we allow one person um, like the creator of Amazon have so much wealth and yeah. many, many people are have nothing. That's, that's the, one of the reasons for, for, for these decisions. Okay. So what does the, the Museum of Care um, look like? For people that may have uh, no understanding or no conception of this kind of um, movement that, that you're creating, uh, what does it look like now? Are there are there spaces around the world where you're having residencies with artists? Or... Um, so we just started. Yeah, so it's a good question. Maybe uh, uh, we can <laughs> we can come up together with the answers. <laughs> it's uh, we just started in uh, after the carnival that mm -hmm. was uh, 11 of uh, October, and we are going to open the museum next October 11 uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. So. It started from uh, me announcing that uh, David Graeber's house in Fire Island in New York will be a residency. And then um, uh, very quickly, uh, many other people joined and said, okay, we have a place to share. We also want to create a residency. One of them was Dennis with his uh, amazing place in Spain. Yeah. Um, and then we started to think around that, around physical residences and we started to to have a conversation and said is it for the artist is it for mm. the refugees is mm. it for for whom is that who is valuable enough to to be invited to these places mm. um and then slowly like a discussion evolve um so now we created a website uh, with the social network with the mailing lists where the people discussing how to how to make it work. So it will be something for now looks like in between of um, uh, offline spaces that mm -hmm. hopefully we will have more and more. And uh, this offline spaces will have a project. Um, mm -hmm. And this project is supposed to be um, educational cultural projects, but not for artists, but for everyone. So our idea that uh, like human beings are naturally um, creative and everybody mm -hmm. has a right and intention to do creative uh, work. So uh, we will uh, basically invite to this residency people who will join uh, our projects that we're putting together now. And what do you hope people will explore in these projects? A, a society built on the values of care and how to build it? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, very well. And how, what does a society of care look like to you? And what things that are pervasive in our current society do you think we immediately need to address? So the example of society of care, um, it could be many examples, but yeah. uh, one of them that was really striking for me, a couple of years ago, I went to, in New York to the lecture of anthropo anthropologist uh, and ar archaeologist, archaeologist Rosa Marie Joyce, and she was describing her um, long time research um, about the community that she calls the society of wealthy farmers. Uh, they exist for many, many years, like I think hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, near sex civilization, uh, and they consist of um, uh, what she described as a bunch of villas. So they uh, they all they didn't have any 
big buildings or monuments or you know central banks or government palaces they have like this very luxurious uh villas in which uh, families would live and they all were more or less equal size uh in the same time they had a um a division of labor so for example uh, a famous ceramics that was produced in uh like we know from Atsek actually was produced by these guys they were just selling them to Atsek so they were using this amazing objects that's now in the museums as mm. a daily uh, daily you know cups and uh, mm. plates um so and and they were much more sustainable in this like vicious empires with human sacrifices and so on <laughs> and and in a way they uh, they did rearrange the ideas of what is care and maintenance and art and um and so on and so forth and so rosemary joyce was saying that yes the other world is possible it's not only possible like as an archaeologist i can definitely tell you it did exist for longer than mm -hmm. we know our capitalistic civilization like longer than 500 years Okay. Mm, we're just trying to think that uh, it's impossible. Right. Okay. And what do you think are the main principles of, of capitalism that are directly conflicting to achieving a society of care? I think it's about uh, the way how we attribute values to, mm -hmm. to humans and objects and actions. So that's that's the major problem. That's why museums are um, so important. Uh, like, you know, the last two revolutions, Russian revolutions and French revolution started from uh, occupying the museums, you know, Louvre. Yeah, so mm -hmm. like French people took over Louvre, that was a palace and make it a museum in the hope that uh, it's it will be like, you know, a center for, uh, for the celebration of, uh, uh, like major principle of French Revolution. The same things mm -hmm. happens with Russia, but then these museums evolved and become something else. Okay, their their values are attributed elsewhere. Why? Why do you think it, it is contrary to the? Why do you think it is contrary to the prevailing norm uh, to value one's relationships over one's individual identity or one's possessions what, because it seems that in in one's own life it's very clear where your your where joy and love and happiness stems from from you know interactions with with things and with people you know whether it's your house plant or your partner or your cat i have a cat i love my cat um so when we have these very evident examples of what fulfills us and what nurtures us why do you think we seem it's it's so difficult to actually replicate that in society or or hold on to that as a as a value that's an amazing question to tell the truth i don't know answer to that question uh i, I would quote again uh, rosemary joyce uh, who just said in the same lecture that you know sometimes we as a human society just making our own choices you know, we can go right or left, and we decided to go left, and that's lead to the disaster. And uh, all your archaeological research showing that for like, you know, hundreds of years, people were living like, in prosperity and happiness, and then boom, you know, they all <laughs> turn to kill each other, and then um, uh, they turn back. So that's uh, probably that would be the answer. So we should try to do to to make uh, more human choices. Mm. Mm. Do you think um, the there are roots of sexism in the unwillingness to value caregiving uh, as a vital, if not the vital role in society? Totally, yeah. So this is one of the features of capitalism, it's a patriarchal society. And it's not necessarily that, uh, I, I think it's not necessarily only like a biological uh, like, you know, you can have a plenty of biological women who would be more vicious than men, yeah. uh, but definitely it's a, it's a patriarchal society who assign the strongest um, and the production-like people <laughs> power yeah. over the people who is uh, busy with care and maintenance mm. and reproduction of human life. Mm. 
and human <laughs> relationship over the production of things and you know this growth of economy not this stupidity and everybody understands so far even the people who's busy with that that it's mm. just ridiculous you know you cannot grow unlimited growth and limited planet is not gonna work <laughs> as simple <laughs> as that but we still like turn on tv like the same guys are saying the same thing so i think it's it's a really really interesting moment in activism and in um theory uh of like where intersec intersectionalism is coming together you know there's been sort of the, the climate activists and the, the climate academics and it's been the feminists and there's been um you know the the experts on, on race and analyzing race and doing all of the work and we're now all converging on you know the problem is how we treat each other and the planet and it's very 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 root you strip it all back it's this one we're not treating each other well and we are running out of time like that problem has to be addressed right now and it's such an interesting time to to a be alive and b you know attempt to to be doing your part of, of work in the world because you really i mean i personally feel like maybe this is the time where something could happen because now finally we've kind of worked hard enough to to uncover the common threat you know exactly <laughs> yeah what um I'm I'm extremely curious because uh, I I think it's really really hard to undo one's own conditioning, um, and so when I think about because I read your essay and you said something about um, art as a mode of care as a method of care as opposed to a, a product and a means of production, um, but it's so hard to imagine what that would look like <laughs> art that doesn't hang in a museum to be admired or art that doesn't sell for millions at you know ridiculous I don't, I don't even know what they're called fairs <laughs> art that doesn't hang on yachts like what does art as a method of care look like actually, yeah great question actually it's a lot of contemporary art who's trying to research this territory and propose all kind of um, different uh, you know tools and agendas to 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 show how it could be and it's uh, the care the word care become a buzzword recently um so one of the projects uh, that's supposed to rearrange the idea of artists from being this genius to to what the artist being as a facilitator is a project that we are going to propose as one of the um opening projects for museum of k in october 2021 and uh, we started this project with David, and it's supposed to happen in Graz during the festival in um, last October, and it didn't happen because uh, of Sir David's death. So the project calls Visual Assembly, and um, it's uh, we started to do it uh, during lockdown last uh, spring with David because of this endless Zoom meetings, you know, like we were like in the, so many Zooms and. Yeah. Like you were saying about activists, all activists went to the Zoom and started to talk to each other. And we all understand each other well. And we had this like hours of discussion and nothing happens. Yeah. And it's become so frustrating. So we decided, okay, we have to do something offline. We have to touch the real things, you know, and communicate with somebody else who doesn't know our email address so we cannot invite them to the zoom party. and so at the same time the, the only activist demo that we participated with david was a black life like um, during lockdown a couple of months so it was this black life matter and um it was very overwhelming because it was thousands of people in london and everybody was like really really kind of you know so so emotional about that and then we saw um, uh, monument destructions that was happening mm -hmm. everywhere in the world mm -hmm. and it was very obvious to us that these monument destructions colonials and mm -hmm. racist and killers basically who was removed from the monument like uh, from the monuments this is a this is a action of the public art it this is a collective public art because these monuments were not only destroyed it's also was a lot of uh, you know, graffiti, people were writing slogans. So if you look at what uh, remains after the monuments would be destroyed, 
this will be a different sculpture. It's, it was just not kind of documented and put it in the museums, you know, and it's naturally mm-hmm. occurred by itself. So that's how we like started to do this visual assembly. And we did once in Partabella Road um, in the main square. So it was me, David, and uh, one of our neighbor, um, Olga. And so we went there with the sprays and stencils and we had our activist friends on Zoom from Extinction Rebellion. And mm-hmm. um, so they had an assembly and they were discussing how the city of care would look like, how, you know, we will run the city that is based on care and not on the production, the city that replace uh, the very notion of consumption and production with the care and freedom. And so what David and I did, we just sprayed the, the trees and like, you know, the center of the city that they told us to do on the main square with the sprays from chalk. So it was like a huge thing, like, you know, a couple of meters. And um, like people were passing by and then join us. <laughs> some teenagers join us and some others like started to, to, to also do the same. And, uh, and then this um, big graffiti was staying there, like basically until it was washed away with, uh, with rain for a couple of months because it was under oh, some, wow. some kind of tent. Um, and we tried like it was a lockdown so we were not able to to have a big party with that but we did it in this uh, like COVID mode and so that's what going to happen next uh, october we will propose people from all around the world to download stencils or to draw their own mm-hmm. and to to create this public artwork but this time we're going to talk about what is museum of care what is a sacred place and how it may look like um, okay. If this museum would not store things, but will store relationship, you know, so how would it, mm. how it may look like? Should it be a school? Should it be a hospital? Should it be, a, I don't know, kind of church? Should it be a place for magic? And so on and so forth. So, I mean, surely by by the logic of, of trying to rearrange um, society and our values, we should seek to do away with sacred with even the concept that well there's a sacred place because that would then denote that somewhere else is secular and in fact what we're trying to say is that anywhere you have a a relationship with something you have the potential to make that sacred because that is what is vital to, to human existence and human joy and human expression right yeah exactly oh god i'm school i would vote i would vote for school young people are so brilliant and and open and um flexible in their thinking you know yeah yeah it's actually interesting that it's more now we are more not in the even class war uh we are more in the generational wars because Mm. uh it's in the last election in the uk it was a strike in numbers that if only people after 50 would vote it will be almost no labor mp but if Mm. the people um under 35 or 40 would, will vote, then it will be no Tories. So basically, yeah. you can change the whole political system just by uh, changing the age group. Yeah. And 70% yeah. of American is for socialism, <laughs> you know. So yeah. that's it's just, yeah, that's, uh, that's the world we're living in. Well, sure, because um, before class was some kind of anchor or path in society, whereas now, you know, you're born to middle class parents good luck to you doesn't mean shit it's not going to protect you from from the the um what's the word i want to use yeah, yeah. Death. Yeah. yeah so yeah. everybody who's uh uh who is who has an education more likely to have debts especially in the us this is horrible mm-hmm. and then um almost nobody can buy their own house and so yeah and there is no jobs on top of that mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah 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 i mean you know if there are people like you who have really taken the initiative about what this is, this is the restructuring of society and what that has to look like. But I think what we're also seeing is, I mean, that's going to come. Like a, a reshuffle, a restructure is coming, whether we like it or not, because things are going to start to crumble. Um, or, you know, because hopefully people have taken the initiative to to try and figure out what to do about it. Um, yeah. It's basically a choice between uh, either like, you know, some sort of socialism or fascism. Yeah, yeah. And it's a scary, scary choice, of course. Yeah. It is. And 
if I may, I think what is scary about such a choice is that too often neither side really seems to understand what it actually means. I mean, America, like Americans go on about, you know, their fear of socialism. and It's not socialist what they're proposing. AOC, she's not socialist. She, you know, she's talking about the, um, like, Sweden and um, like these Nordic countries as great examples of socialism when they're the countries that don't have, a, you know, a minimum wage. Because actually the values of care are built into their society because they value caregivers. You know, if you want to be a primary school teacher in uh, Sweden, you have to have a PhD <laughs> because they're like, hmm, working with kids, next generation of people, probably one of the most important things that you can do with yourself. <laughs> so there's that. And then there's people, you know, uh, in Europe who spout fascist ideas and they have no idea that it is fascist. You know, the, 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 the dialogue and the education around um, policy and politics and how that translates into reality is completely broken down. Um, and it might be too easy to say, but I think social media might have something to do, <laughs> to do with it. <laughs> Yeah, and social media and also total monopolization of any media. So I think all the media projects, independent media projects now is so important. It's like our hope. Yeah. Yeah. The I don't know. As a okay, as a vaguely ex journalist, but more importantly, somebody that um kind of grew up uh, around a lot of journalism. Uh, the thing that I think could be really, really helpful right now is actually an objective news source, which was originally like the, the role of the media, um, because there is so much fear and there is so much anger that people are rightly have opinions about what to do. Um, but if you give an opinion to somebody that doesn't like what you're saying, now they have so many options of who to go to and what to listen to, they will simply turn away. Whereas my personal belief is we need to be empowering people to 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 think critically, mm -hmm. to take facts and, and deduct. Um, and because of the partisan lines that are being drawn around such, you know, like the the US and the stimulus check, you know, what was it, $1,800 for this year uh, Americans got in terms of help from their government. And because they have partisan media, no, nobody objective, it, it's become mm -hmm. a, a political thing as opposed to everybody just being able to shake hands and agreeing, yeah, that's absolutely shocking. <laughs> so independent media is very important. I think also objective media is very, very important. Yeah, but it's a question of power. So how would you do that, you know? Yeah, yeah. How, how yeah. do you decide who is objective? <laughs> but also, yeah, yeah because, you know, if the, if the power is on the hands of the people who's given this 1800 check, then, you know, let them set up objective media. <laughs> we will know mm -hmm. what happens. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's such a shame, actually, that when you think of what Facebook could have been, it could have been an objective media with people sharing their, their genuine experiences. Um, and it's become a veritable war of opinion with not many people making their own. Uh, such a shame. We seem to have lost each other there for a minute. Um, but no matter, we will find where we, where we were. <laughs> Um, Nika, I'd be really interested to know about um, how you became an artist and how you find your, found yourself um, at this juncture of, or at this point of, of trying to create a society of care, what the defining experiences were for you that, that have led you here. So I was born in the uh, Soviet Union in, uh, in a middle class family. My parents were engineers in Leningrad and I lived in a uh, Job in the kind of uh, new construction uh, uh, middle class area of uh, Leningrad. And so, as I said, in the weekends, we will go to Hermitage, to the center of the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, this idea of having like the sacred place where the real value was uh, born uh, while you are living in this mundane life that, you know, kind of doesn't have a lot of um, interesting aspects and was people uh, going to this busher jobs. Uh, Soviet Union was famous for the busher jobs created the much earlier. Jobs. No, bullshit jobs. Oh, They're bullshit, bullshit jobs. Yeah, yeah, you know, like every, everybody would be like, it's like at least that's what they think they were, like compared to our capitalistic society now, 
actually it wasn't so much bullshit jobs as we have in the West now, but back in Soviet Union, uh, everybody was complaining about bureaucracy, about this endless amount of engineers that's doing nothing, just, you know, uh, chatting with each other and drinking tea all day and so on. But museums and art, art and uh, theaters um, and music, uh, that uh, chess, that was um, some kind of um, fantastic realm for the Soviet people. And in this uh, article that I wrote with David, one of this, um, one of the chapters of the articles calls another art world talking about prolet cult. It's like the invention in Soviet Union and uh, revolution. It's actually um, allow. Sorry, what, what was it? Prolet? Aryan culture. It's like a shot ah. from prolet. Yeah. yeah. Pro- yeah. yeah, and this is like a really, really interesting um, idea and project uh, that maybe <laughs> like for an, a topic for another conversation, I would gladly share. <laughs> that, that was uh, from one side that allow all these millions of Soviet people, including myself, to join, um, you know, to be able to study how to draw, how to play piano, and so on and so forth. But from another side, it's arranged the society in a way that it's always would be somebody who is in the museum, and it would be majority of the people who's outside of the museum, and they are supposed to to be like, you know, in the second position of maintenance <laughs> jobs, you know, mm-hmm. just to go to museum at Maya, or to write down the name of the artist and the dates when he was born and died to memorize, to mm. <laughs> to kind of be closer to the sacred space, as you said. Mm. So, and that's uh, that was, I think, um, very logical for many people, and including myself, try to to be free, try to to achieve something in which you would you would be yourself a creator. And of course, I was attending one of those art schools uh, from age 12. Um, yeah, that's how I mm. was started to 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 move toward becoming an artist. And now um, I just reconsider the idea of what does it mean to be an artist. And that what does it mean to be an artist today? It, it depends on for whom. So yeah, we have a professional art world. We have many art worlds. In this case, we have. A, mm. Uh, strongest hierarchy in this art world and in the same time the art world and the museums and the whole cultural field is operating as a promise of uh, liberation for everybody and that's why people keep going to museums and keep going to the like you know concerts and ballet and theater performances because they hope to to be and if liberated, lifted up, you know? elevated, yeah, elevated. But mm. in the same time, it's a place uh, that built uh, as an exclusionary place, as a place where like the line defines: this is famous, this is not; this is valuable, mm. this is not; this cost millions, this cost nothing, uh, mm. and so on and so forth. You know, as mm. as in the rest of the society. Mm. So again, creating that um, binary of sacred and and secular, and people trying to have some piece of sacredness or the divine within them by attending, you know, that which, you know, high culture. Yeah. We should say that uh, every human society definitely have, uh, have the idea of sacred. That's that's unavoidable because we're human. But the question is where we place the sacred, you know, the sacred could be a nature (laughs) or it could be like, you know, something that um, we all equally related to Mm. or sacred could be something that possessed by somebody like a bank account that allow a person to control uh, like half of the planet, you know. Mm. So that's uh, like money could be sacred too. Mm. Or like, you know, Joseph Stalin can be sacred or the idea Mm. of the German nation could be sacred. And that's allow mm-hmm. everybody else to kill uh, everybody who who hold this sacred whatever to 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 torture and kill the others. So the sacred other. is unavoidable, but uh, mm-hmm. but it's a very big question: what, how we attribute this? Yeah, a very big question: how we attribute um, the divine and sacredness. 
and and that which is secular. So we wrote the book with David also. It's it's a kids book. It's called What Are Kings, and uh, it's a bunch of stories and questions exactly about this particular subject. So, who has the power? Why? How it happens that these people have the power? Was it always like that? <laughs> uh, like and yeah, and so on and so forth. And we put it in the um, in a very uh, um, kind of kids format based on also. Soviet early children literature ideas um, uh, of Russian avant-garde, you know, when, mm. when you have this, like, so I, I was like a child and David was as an adult, so I would ask questions and he would reply me. So and we had this mm. conversation as in Mayakovsky book, um, what is good and what is bad? Mm-hmm. <laughs> when the child is coming to the father and asking him, like, mm. so how are world built? What is good and what is bad? And mm. so on and so forth. And the father is mm. replying. That's fascinating. At, at what stage did you um, recognize that you wanted to to create works for for children and to help children? Because I think I think it's crucial. It's vital. It's fascinating. Uh, so I'd love to know a bit more. So first of all, um, again, it's my Soviet childhood, and Soviet literature was uh, Soviet children literature was an amazing um, experiment because. Uh, so Soviet Union, so Soviet uh, Russian Empire was an empire with like many many nations living in, and uh, when the revolution happened, Soviet Union, um, so the task was to create a new nation, Soviet people, and uh, through the children literature, uh, this was the way how they did it, and at the same time, it's coincide the born of this uh, project of Soviet children literature coincide with the. Um, Contrevolution, the repressions of uh, Stalinist terror and so on. So many of the uh, important uh, writers and um, poets and uh, artists were not able to work anymore as an adult. And so they all went to the children literature to to make some money and to be outside of censorship. And that's become like a great project. And then uh, in my personal life, um, uh, when I was 32, 34 years old, I moved to the US um, and my son Benjamin was born. And so I started to, that's the time when I actually started to learn English and read Dr. Seuss, who was correlated to Soviet um, mm. Soviet poetry. I published Dr. Seuss in Russian, actually. Uh, oh, did just, you? Yeah, just, just because I wanted to say very much uh, like my... Um, you know, just I was so happy to that I found Dr. Seuss, yeah. and yeah, and then and then uh, I started to to kind of read a lot of books with my son, and uh, um, and then once I bought him a book uh, about pirates. He was like uh, five years old, five or six, mm-hmm. and uh, the idea was like a lot of pictures, big letters. So we study um, reading Russian and English. And then the book was so boring, you know, and I was like, I was hoping like, you know, pirates is like first anarchistic community. They're so adventurous. They're so bloody. They, they are the one who created the stories. So the pirates would be like very attracted to him. But then we read it and my God, we both were like totally, totally disappointed. And then I realized, okay, that's what don't exist. Uh, somebody should do the books that for kids that will actually talk to them as they are adults about very serious questions that mm. every human being doesn't matter if he's five or 95 years old will ask yourself or himself uh, mm. the questions that uh, define us as human beings that Dostoevsky called uh, curse questions uh, what is death what is life what is family and so on and so forth what is kings what is power mm. What is money? And so that's uh, how it started. And at the same time, I met David, uh, David Graver, and he was an anthropologist. And so we started to communicate. And basically, this uh, all projects born as a result of conversation between two men, <laughs> my son, five years old Benjamin, and, uh, you know, uh, Professor uh, David Graber, <laughs> who like sent me the anthropological text to read and the chapters of his books. So that's how it's evolved. Oh, that's wonderful! What an organic uh, thing to happen. That's amazing <laughs> and interesting because, like, it's really funny that you bring this up because last night I was actually speaking to somebody and 
um, they said if they could go back and redo their parenting, one thing they would do differently is like not talk down to their children, i.e., mm. not tell them bullshit, not tell them about Santa, not feel, you know, not speak to them as if they're children, but actually understand that they're incredibly intelligent and they have an incredible capacity to learn and speak to them, you know, about the important stuff in life. Yeah, uh, and yet it's completely completely contrary to you know how people sort of tend to treat their kids yeah because that's the moment when we form our major you know answers in a way uh, yeah and that's uh, then we replicate it uh, in our own life and the life of um, other people that's how actually relationship are born the future relationship with mm-hmm. the other human beings um, our like you know this social tissue that we produce and create and recreate yeah so that's why i think that uh, children literature is extremely important much more much more important when we think um, it is um, because now we kind of outsource uh, all this children education it's more like um entertainment area or yeah. it's uh, you know something where like uh, kids are passing tests and trying to define their yeah. future social uh, strata where they will. How, um, how did Benjamin re- respond to it? Because you, you must have seen a difference between, you know, reading, I mean, Dr. Seuss is fucking brilliant. Uh, but, you know, reading other literature, like the Boring Pirates book, and then having these very serious conversations about what it is to be a human. How did your young son respond to it? Oh, he, of course, he, he, as, as every other child will do. <laughs> he didn't uh, like the boring stuff and he was all for the, for the real conversation. Mm-hmm. And so then we moved to Berlin from um, New York. And because I want him to speak Russian and he was almost never in Russia, I started to make um, classes with um, Russian kids the same age. Every Sunday I was doing it for like two years. And yeah, and different, we, we just keep doing these different projects and um, uh, work around the, the different ideas. Yeah, I think it mm. was really, uh, really important for him and for, for the other kids who join us. Um, and also I want to say that uh, kids are all genius. <laughs> there is no non-genius child unless we, we make the child, uh, you know, to be non-genius by explaining him or her that and kind of putting them in a situation when they restrained from their like natural ability. There's uh, a beautiful story, and I and I can't remember the the source. And so, um, somebody will know it. Some somebody somewhere will know it. Um, and it's about there. There was this young girl, and she was seen as a problem child in in her primary school class. She was only like five, six, seven, eight, and her parents were, were brought in time and time and time again to say, you know, she's not learning. She's got learning disability. She's really disruptive. She's gonna have to be moved, you know, to some special class. Da 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 da. And they took her to see a child psychologist, and it was one of those fancy psychologists, and he had one of those, you know, uh, one two way mirrors, and so. He um, he spoke to the girl for only about five minutes and then he brought her parents out into the other room to look through the, the mirror. And he said, there's nothing wrong with your child. She's a dancer. And that was it. The girl had so much physical energy and had so much natural instinct to express herself through movement that being told to sit down on a chair for five hours a day at primary school was was it was bad for her, essentially. And she grew up to, to be, uh, you know, a real amazing professional dancer. It's exactly as you say, we restrain children's natural ability to do the things that they love and the things that they want to express. That is when you kill their, their innate genius. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you find uh, parents respond to, to the books? Um, parents are great. It's like, difficult to deal with publishers. <laughs> We were trying to publish this King books with David for like, you know, a long time. It was a funny story. And David is a famous writer. So we got like a famous literature agent in the beginning. She was saying, oh, my God, this is such a cool book. Everything is great. Just change here. And then she was like, and now uh-huh. there, and now here. And like, you know, we have to define precisely which age group is that. And if it's more for boys or for girls. And this is this is this. And then by the end of like, I don't know, half a year of changes, 
we were like, wait a minute, what did you like in this book in the first place? <laughs> because it's like nothing left. She just wanted us to do some encyclopedia of kings and queens. Mm. And like, mm. you know, I would draw like a pictures and David will write some kind of summary and put his name and that will be the book. And we're like, no. Sounds like a museum. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, diff difficult to, it's like you, you're entering some certain organized space exactly as a museum and you try to do something different. And of course, in the museum, you, you, you already have this defined space between like mm. the museum guards and museum objects and this and that and this is how they start the day and this is how they end the day so you cannot do it inside of museum pretty much or very rarely you can do anything new so that's why visual assembly we are we are going to take outside of museum so as we said we don't need to occupy hermitage all over in that matter we just can go on the streets and um mm. and now with like social media and so on uh, potentially um we can have uh, much more audience than in the museums that is closed mm. what do you think about um creating space uh whether it's a visual assembly online um on and using tools to do it and to broadcast it that are really contrary to a caring ideology because this this is something i think about quite a lot in terms of broadcasting my work on things like facebook and instagram when you know i'm inherently um wary suspicious and worried about the effects of these of, of this monopoly uh, and of social media on society so uh, is that something you think about it and uh, if so how do you navigate it um you, you're asking, uh, so can, can I clarify a question? Mm -hmm. uh, you're asking if uh, the social media itself is dangerous or if our um, way to relate to each other through the technology, like we're talking with you now, not in person, but uh, through some kind of program, uh, mm -hmm. is dangerous? No, no, no. I'm, um, I, I, I didn't explain it very well at all. Uh, what I'm asking is if, you encounter a, a moral and a theoretical uh, problem with using these tools like social media, which are very anti-care, in order to broadcast and spread the message mm. of care. Mm. Yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think uh, the message itself uh, should be not packaged, but constructed in a very thoughtful way. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what we can do, what we try mm -hmm. to control, but then we just spread it every way possible. Um, but also it's interesting to think what media to use and how to rearrange the media. Like with Museum of Care, uh, we had a very interesting conversation now. So we use a website, we built a website on WordPress and we have, um, I think a group in the Facebook and probably we will do groups on Twitter and I don't know any other media but um, recently we started to work uh, uh, with a guy named John Foss and he's a media professor and also um, our team is uh, guys from Extension Rebellion uh, mm -hmm. who is uh, these brilliant designers and they're not designers who's like creating stuff they're designers who are thinking about how to how to speak in the public space i would say mm -hmm. so we are, we are now uh, researching how to move to discord or mm -hmm. to create something in discord because uh when we talk about social media we're talking about this old platforms uh as facebook and twitter and so on but now it's so many new things coming with the new generation like to my understanding, and I didn't know anything about Discord. This just I just learning now. Uh, this is a gaming platform that uh, has 250 million people, and uh, so very big. And they have a different way of um, um, different tools of communicating inside, uh, very different from Facebook and the other media, social media. And mm -hmm. uh, apparently Discord is very political too, because when they become popular, they were invaded by the white supremacists and mm -hmm. um, right-wing people. 
and they took a deliberate state steps to get rid of them. Oh well. I so so I think maybe we have a hope with uh, this new wave of uh, uh, social platforms that uh, mm-hmm. primarily inhabited by the young people. So mm-hmm. basically, it's a different generation, and uh, that come up from, for example, gaming world, but now position themselves as being social platform. So, for mm-hmm. example, Discord changed the uh, statement. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, it's actually, you you are genuinely trying to transition towards something that has a, a more democratic history and, and message. Huge. Great. That's so good to hear. That's so good to hear. I would like to, to, to ask you kind of in that same vein, um, what do you think uh, a first step is people can take to creating a society of care around them? Um, I'm not a good person to answer. So I'm like, because my question, is, uh, I have the same question. <laughs> but what we're, what we're trying to do, we're trying to create this museum in which people will make um, rooms Mm. Uh, that they can curate and inhabit and we are not going to censor them until they become mm. dangerous, for example, for, for the rest. But uh, so to myself, I answer this question that the major um, way would be just to try to build something that working as an example, as, uh, as opposed to tell other people what they should do. Very rarely work <laughs> and um, you know, also kind of oppressive. So, and I think many people trying to do that. Like if we talk about education, I was uh, once part of them, and now I'm checking out with them, this wonderful network of free and democratic education. This is a, a big network of people who is creating schools based on them, an educational platform based on the idea that every child has a right to choose with whom, when, and how he or she is studying. And that's a very different idea from the normal education. Yeah. And so you can see that the schools are working for many years, like Summer Hill will be 90 years old. Uh, wow. So that's a long, uh, long time. And uh, they have many kids who grow up and become like a famous and good adults. So that's, uh, I think that's we're trying to do this with um, Museum of Care. And I believe it's many other initiatives around the world like, for example, Dennis' uh, initiative. Or mm-hmm. I was thinking to whom I would like to recommend you as a uh, yeah. person for the platform. And I was thinking, uh, the, um, I have so many recommendations, but I will start from Claire Farrell. Uh, Claire Farrell is um, she's a fashion designer who is developing the um, sustainable fashion, like not mm-hmm. because fashion is like a really... Bad and has its issues, yeah. yeah, yeah. But she also she also active member of Extinction Rebellion, and that's like a great uh, group of people, you know, in the UK. Yeah. They started that, and they were very brave in what they did, yeah. uh, like really putting their lives on the line, you know. And uh, what they did, they radicalized the message. Instead of like saying, "Oh, let's recycle." Let's like save some specific like, you know, beers or like some other animals. They were just yeah. saying, guys, like, you know, we're fucked up. <laughs> they, they were telling the truth. Mm. And they and uh, and yeah, and it's a it's a, I know that it's a difficult time actually for Extension Rebellion now because uh, they're kind of attacked by, I think, uh, media recently mm. quite heavily. Mm-hmm. But uh, this is a people who can tell the the good contemporary stories about uh, what is really going on on the on the ground and how how we, we can take uh, steps to rearrange society that will not only basically pacify our fears and our bad feelings, mm. but also try to really change something. Mm. Nika, I think you've you've brought us to a really beautiful natural end there because what you've done, I think, is so caring because you've, um, without being asked even, you've taken time out of of your interview to platform somebody else and to highlight your relationship with them and their relationship with with others and the work that they're doing. Uh, So I thank you for that. And I thank yeah. you very, very much for this interview. It was absolutely fascinating. And I will be sure to, to reach out to Claire and see if we can get her on the show to continue the dialogue. Great. Yeah, I can introduce you to Claire. Please do. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Thank you, Nika. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> 
Hi everyone, you can find the link to the Museum of Care in the show notes. If you're interested or want to know more about it, I'm sure they would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Do leave a review to let us know what you think. And if you liked it, please give the show a five star rating. It really helps increase our visibility and the visibility of the amazing people we speak to every week. You can also find Platform Enterprise on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. The podcast episodes are now up on YouTube too on our channel. Um, But the best thing to do would be to head on over to www.platformenterprise.com and subscribe so that you get an email every time that um, I send out a new investigation or a new podcast episode. And that means I don't have to create content for content's sake on these big tech platforms that I really don't understand how to use. So I'd be really grateful for that. So head on over, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for your support.